great. Um, so welcome everyone to the uh, GIST Lunch Seminar Series. Um, I'm really happy today to have Dr. Simon Lee, who's a, a postdoctoral research scientist in the Department of Applied Physics and Applied Math uh, at Columbia. Uh, he, he recently came to New York uh, back in November, so he's been here for a few months. Um, he holds a, a PhD from the Department of Meteorology at the University of Reading. Um, and he's also one of uh, two editors-in-chief of the Royal Meteorological Society Journal Weather. Um, Simon has done some really nice work looking at uh, stratospheric uh, uh, tropospheric coupling, um, mainly in the context of more kind of S to S timescales, um, but he's done really kind of a, a, a work on a wide var variety of topics. Um, Simon, we're really happy to have you here today. Um, and before I turn it to you, uh, I just wanted to make a note that, um, as with all seminars, uh, if you have a question, um, please indicate that in the chat. Um, either write the question or indicate that you have one, um, and then I can unmute you and you can ask that to Simon. Uh, we are recording this, so uh, there will be a, a, a video of this presentation available within about kind of one to two weeks on the GIST website. Uh, so I'm going to turn off my camera for bandwidth at this point, um, and then uh, Simon, just whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you for a great introduction, um, Clara. Hopefully, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, and and thank you all for 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 coming for spending your lunch hour there to listen to me talk about really kind of the, this idea of understanding North American weather and climate variability using a regime based approach. Uh, and so today I'll sort of go through why we should um, consider regimes as a framework for describing weather and climate variability over North America, review some definitions of regimes that have been used um, in the past, just get a pointer on, talk about a subset or a, a specific set of North American regimes and how these are modulated by changes in the strength of the stratospheric polar vortex. Then I'll discuss uh, the Texas cold wave from February 2021 in the context of regimes, how whether regimes explain the event that occurred, uh, and then have a brief look at this winter, which is something I was thinking about long back when um, I was invited to, to do this talk, was, uh, was thinking about we're coming toward the end of winter now, how, how have the regimes been? And then think about sort of where next, where would we take regimes, what might we want to answer further. So let's think about why regimes. Now, um, this is an example of 500 hectopascal geopotential height anomalies over a sector that covers parts of the Pacific, North America, and parts of the Western North Atlantic. And really the, the date, time, and forecast model are not important for, for what I'm asking here, but I'm using it to think about how would you describe this? So would you describe the individual ridges and troughs? Would you resort to modes of variability, e empirical orthogonal functions? Would you start talking about the, the NAO index? Would you think about the Arctic Oscillation, the Pacific North American pattern, the North Pacific Oscillation? Would you describe those components of the flow separately? But how do you convey what matters? In this example, would you perhaps say, well, that ridge to the southeast of Greenland probably doesn't matter for North American weather in, in this example. What would you do if you had 51 ensemble members like ECMWF do at, say, three weeks ahead when there's very large spread? How would you try and convey all these different components together and give a real idea of what's going on? And that's the sort of thing that's particularly important if you're giving an understanding of the forecast or the predictability to people who have to make decisions or even just the general public. And then how do you pick out those signals at longer lead times? How do you work out what matters? Well, you might have information about the way the NAO is set to evolve, but how does that affect everything depending on what the PNA is doing in these different ensemble members at different lead times? <clears throat> and so I always use this to kind of think that you might end up going into what I think Lorenzo called uh, in a conversation I had with him a couple of years ago now, uh, was a zoo of indices because you could you could resort to all of these in isolation and you'd just probably get confused and you would confuse the person you were speaking to. And I think this is why regimes can be a useful framework. 
And so to, to kind of illustrate that, I came up with some example subseasonal forecasts that were based on what we had in December 2021. And so if you take a, a basic EOF or index approach, you would say something like, there is broad agreement that the PNA will remain strongly negative. There is more uncertainty in the NAO, which some members show turning strongly negative from its current positive state, but with the block more east-based, where there will likely be no significant impact on North America. And that's probably quite hard to communicate. It's technical, but it's, it's a little messy, and it's hard to understand quite exactly what the overall story is. And so if you went to, for example, a regime approach, you could say something like, there is very strong ensemble support of a continuation of the current Arctic low regime. The probability of all other regimes is well below climatology. Now, perhaps I'm being a little unfair in that that's a very condensed regime forecast, but I think it illustrates this idea that that's an objectively more straightforward way of saying what the full flow or something close to the full flow is doing at these extended lead times over North America. Now, the elephant in the room whenever I speak about regimes, and I believe it was even in a question in my PhD defense, was, is it really a regime? And there is some ambiguity, or maybe even the abuse of the term regime. So the, the figure on the left, it comes from an old paper from 1983, Camoso and Gill, where they kind of talk about regimes uh, as this almost like an attractor in, in phase space, a, a particular point where trajectories converge. But that's not necessarily what's really rigorously meant when some people, when we talk about regimes. And maybe some uses of the regime are more thoroughly thought of as, as weather types or weather patterns. And, 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 and even furthermore, sometimes the word regime is used when really it's only kind of defined to the extent of saying it is a cluster. And so typically the use of the word regimes refers to <clears throat> at occasions where the, the definition is cluster based, not defined purely from, from an EOF. So sometimes you have these cases where people refer to a period of time where an EOF index is persistently positive, for example, as a regime. For example, you might have a, a PNA pattern, which is positive for a month uh, as an index and refer to that is a regime and, and that can get confusing too and that's particularly true for the Atlantic which I'll mention in a moment and then I think as well it depends on what your approach is and also what your audience is if you're interested in this from a forecast applications perspective whether or not it's a real kind of attractor that fits dynamical systems theory doesn't necessarily matter to what you're trying to convey and do and it, depending on the domain that you're using as well, that, that, can, that can alter things. But if you're speaking to someone who's thinking of this from a dynamics perspective, then that sort of thing really does matter. And you get different, and I, I sort of appreciate this firsthand because when I give this sort of a talk, I get different questions about regimes depending on the kind of people that I'm talking to. And when I speak more to the sort of S2S forecasting people, I never really get so much of an aspect of like, are these real regimes? But if you give a talk to a set of dynamicists, you get the question of, well, maybe they're not real regimes. So that's the, the, the first elephant in the room. And, and the, the, the question goes on to be, well, does the regime physically exist? Is it a real thing? Or is it just some kind of statistical tool that you're using? And there is a new paper in, in GRL where they investigate this for the North Atlantic regimes and, and conclude that they are real. But um, for North America and for a domain that's centered on North America, really you have this idea that you have two storm tracks, the Pacific and an Atlantic storm track, and perhaps they are where the regimes are, but that's not where the people are. And the people and the impacts are in North America, which is between the two. So whether or not you're really getting towards a true dynamical regime in, in, in its truest sense is perhaps, it perhaps suggests that that's not the case, but does it really matter if that's where your impacts are or whether these are truly just recurrent patterns that are useful statistically. For the purposes of what I've generally done, I don't really necessarily think it does matter, but I think you can motivate the choice that you have. And so let's move on to looking a bit at definitions of, of regimes. So the, the, the most well-known regimes are those over the European and North Atlantic sector. Uh, and these are also sometimes really called the, the CASU regimes after uh, Christoph CASU's 2008 nature paper that, that related the modulation of these regimes 
the lagged modulation of these regimes to the, the Mount and Julian oscillation. But they're, they're very popular and they're, they're, the, the plot on the left, for example, is a figure from the new open charts that ECMWF have, which are available for the public, uh, showing the probability of each of these regimes up to 46 days ahead. And this is the most recent one from, from Monday's forecast, which actually shows a, a very high likelihood of, of North, uh, positive North Atlantic oscillation conditions through into March. But really, I think this kind of also illustrates the power of regimes and that that is condensing 46 days of 51 ensemble members into one figure that's very easy to interpret with known recurrent impacts uh, and, and recurrent patterns. And, and so that, that's very popular. And now I mentioned that I'd talk about confusingly um, referring to regimes as, as EOFs or, or, or clusters. And uh, this is perhaps most true for the North Atlantic because two of the clusters are named after the North Atlantic oscillation despite not being, well, first off, they're not symmetric and, and they're not purely dependent on what the NAO EOF is doing. And so they're perhaps better termed Greenland blocking and zonal, but it, it just adds to a little bit of the confusion when explaining this, that you have kind of two NAOs, you have the regime and you have the EOF. Um, and, and Greenland blocking and zonal are what um, Christian Grams's group in Germany, KIT, that's what they had referred to them as. So that's Europe. Now, for, for North America, I think the first thing that, that we should address is, is the domain. And I kind of talk, talk about Pacific North America regime definitions. Um, and, and some studies consider more the, the Pacific sector. Think of that as, like, what, like I was alluding to earlier, thinking about the regimes that might exist in that Pacific storm track. Others are considering more North America because that's where the people are and the, the, the continent's weather is influenced by variability from both ocean basins. And um, so here are some of the older ones as evidenced by the black and white nature, the specifics of which are, are probably less imp important to, to take away. And I'm aware that this figure doesn't come across very well in, in a presentation, but there are, there are a few things. So there's the domain and there's the method. And so going all the way back to 19. 93 for Komoto and Gill, they looked for peaks in the in a PDF of the leading two northern hemisphere EOFs to isolate the PNA pattern and the and the NAO. But they did that for the whole of North America, the, the whole northern hemisphere. And then moving to uh, the Michelangeli paper from, from 1995 that really kind of pushed for this K-means clustering approach for defining regimes, they got three for the North Pacific. And they also got the, the, the Casu type regimes for the North Atlantic. Um, and then Robertson and Gill in 99 also did a PDF bump hunting uh, type approach and, and gained six, um, although I'm not entirely sure of the domain that they used. But you can see that there's some differences in approach and, and domain and number of regimes. And so if we move into the, the 21st century and when color was invented, um, you can go and look at uh, David Strauss's 2007 paper where they used k means clustering here at 200 hectopascals and got these four regimes for a domain which was largely centered on North America. And so this is thinking more about really what matters. And, and so they get a, an Alaskan ridge, Pacific trough, Arctic low and, and Arctic high, which is very negative NAO link. Then the, the Riddle et al paper from 2013, they were considering more the relationship between the, the MJO and regime behavior across both the North Pacific and the North Atlantic. So their regime was very longitudinally broad and kind of included both the, the western North, the eastern north pacific and most of the north atlantic so they end up with seven it's an interesting number to obtain because the, the, you could take the, the three michelangeli north pacific regimes and add them to the four casu regimes over the north atlantic and you would also end up with seven although it's a little more complex than that and then more recently um with the with with people from from columbia and and, and iri and, and apam um there were studies led by Nicholas Vigau and, and Andy Robertson in 2020 that then focused again on, on North America, centrally focusing on North America and, and getting these, these four regimes out, which look very similar to these four from uh, the previous decade. And so there's an element of maybe converging to a solution for these North American regimes. But then, somewhat confusingly, uh, in, in 2021, a new paper came out in WCD from Fabiano et al. 
who investigated these from the perspective of using regimes to discuss um, future climate change. And they looked at the four North Atlantic regimes, but then really because they were considering these as the climate modes in the, in the, in the storm tracks, they then did a Pacific domain rather than a North American centered domain. But what they did end up with was, was three regimes which are similar to three of the, the this North American set. So we have this Pacific trough, which you can see the similarity, uh, a positive PNA, confusingly named in my opinion, because it, it confuses it with a with a, with an index time series, which looks like the Alaskan Ridge, a, a negative PNA, which looks like this Arctic low. But then because their domain didn't go far enough to get that Greenland block and instead went further west into the into the western North Pacific, they then have a bearing ridge as their fourth North Pacific regime. So I think this really underlines this idea that really the key thing that is affecting the number of regimes that you get is the domain under consideration. So perhaps unsurprising, it's just harder to define what you're trying to do when it comes to North America. I personally think, and what, what I've been using in, in my research, is that looking really at that domain that's centered on North America is what's most important for, for understanding the real world impacts on the continent. And so that's uh, what I will move on to defining now. So we're talking about this domain here, which you can see is, is selected to encompass parts of the North Atlantic and parts of the North Pacific, but centered on North America. Uh, and so I'll be looking at regimes that are computed for December to March days. Uh, that was chosen because of the stratospheric variability being maximized during that time period, but it's not hugely sensitive for the choice of winter months. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is to do an EOF decomposition of the, the Z500 field um, in order to, first off, it massively makes the problem a lot easier to solve computationally, but it also somewhat removes a resolution dependence um, of, your, of your data set, and it also gives you a way of interpreting uh, the clusters that you have in terms of known PCs. And then we just take the leading 12, which is about 80% of the variance, in order to kind of do a bit of temporal and spatial smoothing. We don't want those higher frequency variability. And it actually turns out that you don't even need to take as many as 12. We're going to do k-means clustering, with k being equal to 4, k-means clustering uh, minimizing that intra-cluster squared Euclidean distance metric. And then we get two uh, ways of defining the regimes out of that. So we have the, the binary regime definition, which is where we just assign every day to a regime or to a cluster based on its the smallest Euclidean distance in that 12-dimensional PC space to a cluster centroid. And so that's just binary. That's you're in a regime or you're not in a regime. And note, I will kind of use regime to mean the same as the cluster for the, for the sake of simplicity. And then there's also the continuous amplitude definition. That gives you a metric, a continuous metric. So this is more like an EOF time series that allows you to understand the magnitude of the regime, the, the strength of the projection into that regime, which is based on the Michel and Riviere paper from, from 2011 that did it for the North Atlantic. Um, and so that's very similar and analogous to an EOF time series, but with the benefit of not being orthogonal modes. These are trying to represent real things, real patterns that you would see, not just components of the flow. Now, the, the other elephant in the room when talking about regimes and talking about k-means clustering is how do you choose k? Now, various different studies have come up with various different answers for choosing k, again, depending on the purpose of the application. But really, it's a, it's a choice between getting a closer fit of the days to the cluster, so at higher k, you're necessarily, your, your day will always be closer to what one of those centroids look like because you're getting closer to the dimensionality of the original data set. But as you get to higher K, you naturally reduce the persistence of each cluster, each regime, because you're more likely to switch between different ones as, as you move towards refining those finer scales. And then you reduce the, the cluster sample size for each, which in reanalysis here is, is definitely an issue. And then you also introduce slightly more noise. You start concerning yourself with whether in the higher K you're moving towards resolving more synoptic variability, which is a problem, particularly for extended range prediction, because you really just want to get the most useful, but also the, the most condensed view of what these larger scale patterns are like. And then also in larger K, your patterns become similar to each other. And, and I suppose there's also a subjective desire to want to capture what we already know matters and the indices that we're all 
or, or sure of. And actually, um, in this quote from the, the, the Misha Lansley paper, um, is it, I thought quite illustrated just what a, what a problem it was, because he, he says, in fact, three problems arise simultaneously. What is the best partition given the number of clusters K? What is the best number of clusters K? And are the clusters reproducible from another sample of the data? And the paper goes through kind of ways and mechanics to, to ensure that, which I won't delve too much into now. What I will do is use this, um, this big grid of, of different cluster sizes on the left to illustrate a point. So, of course, the basic case is doing k equals 2, but th that's not useful for anyone. So let's start looking with k equals 3. So at k equals 3, you have a Greenland block. You have this wave train with a with sort of a quasi-Alaskan ridge, and then you have this Pacific trough type regime. Once you move to k equals 4, the Greenland blocking stays. That's unaltered from k equals 3. Also, this Pacific trough regime also effectively unaltered. But your middle one splits effectively. It's not quite as simple as that because there is some moving from the other clusters. But this one, you end up with two different ones where you have something that's a more amplified Alaskan ridge, but also something quite different with uh, a more negative PNA type pattern. So if you then go down to k equals 5, you will see that the this Greenland block remains this broadly similar and present, Pacific trough, uh, broadly similar and and pleasant uh, and present, be pleasant as well. Your Alaskan Ridge regime is, is slightly changes into this one, but then you also have something down here which also looks like the Alaskan Ridge. And, and, and whilst this Arctic low or PNA type pattern remains present here. So I think subjectively there's an argument just from looking at that that really going to five from going from four to from three to four gives you something new. Going from four to five doesn't quite give you something new and potentially is just introducing uh, further noise in the sense that these are both a ridge trough kind of pattern. They are, of course, different because the way, the way it's done, but I think that's a subjective argument for choosing four. More, more quantitatively, let's think about inertia. And, and by that, I mean the sum of the squared distances of the samples to their nearest cluster centroid in PC space. And that's what K means minimizes. And that's shown here with the with the with the gray uh, gray curve. And so for higher K, you will always end up with lower inertia because you're essentially getting a better fit of each day. And you're almost getting higher resolution data. But, and I think this is what this shows, that you're you're effectively getting diminishing returns perhaps unexpectedly for, for higher k, but I think there's a, almost evidence of a scale change at k equals 5. So this, this black line is showing the percentage gain in, uh, or the percentage reduction maybe in, in inertia for adding an extra cluster relative to k equals 2. And so you have this almost linear behavior for three, going up to 3, going from 3 to 4. But then once you transition from 4 to 5, you start going up on this slower trajectory, this uh, shallower trajectory. And to me, that kind of indicates that once we get beyond that, we start resolving a different type of scale, almost more like a synoptic scale or a higher frequency of variability. Maybe you could think about that like the turbulence scales. And so I think you could argue from that, again, maybe it's a little bit qualitative, that four is the, is the largest number before you change trajectory, you change tack. Um, so that might not be that convincing. There is certainly some more maths you can do in it, but I, I like to think of this in a more applicable sense because sometimes I've had to convince people who are looking at this from a forecasting perspective about how to do that and trying to argue it sometimes from maths doesn't doesn't work. So let's look more closely at these four regimes or four clusters that we have. So these are for era five, for DJFN days from the start of era five, the, the <clears throat> satellite era, era five anyway in January 1979, through to five days ago, which is as recent as era five goes. And so we have this Arctic high regime, which is like the negative NAO regime or a Greenland block. We have Arctic low, um, which is and, and like the negative PNA. We have this Alaskan ridge, which is actually most similar to a pattern known as the tropical northern hemisphere pattern, but otherwise looks a bit like a, 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 a tropical originating wave train. And then a Pacific trough uh, regime, which features a Pacific trough, but is perhaps uh, evidently associated with an elongated North Pacific jet. And the names come back from the David Strauss paper uh, from 2007. And so I think 
you can hopefully see that these are capturing modes or patterns that you're familiar with. This, this negative PNA pattern is perhaps like a, a La Nina type pattern. This is perhaps more like an El Nino pattern. This might be familiar to some of you um, from the uh, cold winter of 2014. We'll talk about that a bit later. And, and I think this is fairly self-explanatory as, as a Greenland block. It's also perhaps worth noting that the percent of days in this period that are assigned to Arctic low and Alaskan ridge is actually very similar. So sometimes depending on the period of time you use these switch order. Now, what regimes give you the ability to do is to condense um, effectively 44 years of your regimes or 44 years of, of weather variability into one figure. And um, it's quite a noisy figure, obviously, but I don't think there's any other way of, of doing that. And I think that illustrates the power. So let's see that. And um, so this is the daily era five North American weather regime type from 1979 through to five days ago. So this is every day just assigned to a regime. Uh, and perhaps you can see within that, that there are periods of time where you have something that could really be classified as a regime which is here where you have the Arctic low regime persistent for uh, more than a month. Um, and then there are other cases where you have cases where it's probably not true that a regime is truly active and you're just kind of bouncing between um, being a long way from any of the regimes. Uh, and there's an example, perhaps, I think in, in here, you can see certain several days just bouncing between a few of them. It's, th that is an argument having a category of a no regime where you are um, not assigned to any of them. Which, which is something to consider. But I think this is really interesting because it does allow you to just look at 44 winters in one figure and you can pick out extreme patterns and extreme configurations from that, which I think is quite powerful. So talking of extremes, let's think about severely cold weather since that's something that, that is important during the winter time. Uh, and this is something we, we explored in a GRL paper a couple of years ago. So we said, what's the probability of a severely cold day given each regime? And I think uh, the, the first thing is, is that for a Pacific trough regime, severely cold days for most of North America are effectively absent. This is the warmest uh, of the four regimes. For the Arctic low, the severely cold days generally contain just to the west coast of the, of the continent. Uh, for the Arctic high, I would say that they're elevated across most of the contiguous US, but not hugely, and certainly nothing compared with what's actually going on downstream of that Greenland block over Northwest Europe. Although this is perhaps interesting for a different kind of more subtropical impact. But what really stands out is this Alaskan Ridge, which has this very high probability of severe cold um, over where people live uh, and where the impacts are largest uh, over the central US. And that's equivalent in magnitude to what we're seeing in the Arctic High for Europe. So really that's saying that this Alaskan ridge is, is kind of as important for severe cold in North America as something like a Greenland block or a negative NAO is for, for Northwest Europe. And there's a couple of upcoming papers that investigate that a bit closer. We can also then use these regimes, not just to look at that in, inter, uh, the, the intra-annual variability, but look on the larger scales. And we can do that by considering the number of days in each winter that are assigned to each of the regimes. Uh, and the, the dashed line being the average for this period. And hopefully what you can see from all of those is that there isn't necessarily a huge trend in any of them, but there are some noteworthy extremes, um, most of which have actually occurred recently, um, except for this Pacific trough extreme from 1983. And, and I think most of them will readily be, hopefully you'll be able to link them in your minds to things which happen that we know of in the climate system. So the 2010 winter when we had a lot of Greenland blocking um, and it was, there, was, there were talk, talk, talk of, um, it really ignited the sort of warm Arctic cold continent type pattern discussion. The Arctic low during the extremely strong stratospheric vortex winter of 2019-20, the Alaskan ridge that was present um, for, for previously un unprecedented duration during uh, winter 2013-14, when we had all that severe cold over North America, which links with uh, the, the figure from the previous slide. And then the Pacific trough that was present for this huge 86 days during the extreme El Nino winter of, of 1983. So I think those, those link to, uh, to known extremes in the climate system. <clears throat> and I think there's also a suggestion that we're perhaps seeing more of those extremes recently, although it's difficult to draw conclusions, but it is worth noting how many of those arrows are within the last 20 years. Now, there is a very weak positive trend in the Arctic low occupation, seasonal occupation frequency. 
I don't want to dwell too much on this because uh, it, it's not something I've fully quantified, but I did think it was worth pointing out that if you look at the trend in C500 over this domain, it projects very strongly positively onto this regime pattern. And so this is with the Northern Hemisphere trend removed. So that kind of ed, almost like an eddy trend in, in height in the Northern Hemisphere um, since 1979-80 is similar to this regime. So it, it does make sense that, that perhaps we've seen more, although whether it's a chicken or an egg problem is, is yet to be determined, I would say. Uh, so now let's, let's move on to looking at uh, regimes and the stratosphere. And so this, this is um, a large part of, of what my PhD involved. And so we're really thinking about the, the lower stratospheric polar vortex, which is where things are going to influence the troposphere and also where we have that very long persistence time scale that's going to be useful um, for the extended range. And we're going to think about the tersiles of the zone means on wind at 100, 100 hectopascal 60 north during winter is like a first order of stratospheric variability and ask what the probability of each regime is given the strength of U100. Now, before I um, did this in during my PhD, Andrew Tom Perez uh, did this in a 2018 paper for the North Atlantic regimes. And they found um, this. So this is the probability of the regime given the vortex state. And what you can see is that there are large changes in the likelihood of NAM minus for uh, a weak vortex versus a strong vortex. NAO plus slightly less of a, an apparent sensitivity in the opposite direction. Also, the Atlantic Ridge regime, more likely when the vortex is strong, which I think is a really interesting finding that hadn't otherwise um, really been realized. And then they have this regime that didn't really kind of change much, that didn't really seem to care whether or not the stratosphere changed in that Scandinavian blocking. And so uh, I then went and did this for the, for the four North American regimes uh, and found, interestingly, some similarities. So we have perhaps unexpectedly, uh, perhaps perhaps as we would expect even, the Arctic high regime, which is like the negative NAO, much more likely when the vortex is weak versus strong. You have two regimes more likely when the vortex is strong, so that's the Arctic low and the Pacific trough, but this, the, the apparent sensitivity is a bit weaker, um, and it's certainly not as much as that. And we have one regime which is apparently Again, insensitive, equiprobable, regardless of the state of the U100. And so what's interesting from that is that the magnitude of the differences in the regime probabilities there are similar to what was going on over north, the North Atlantic. And that's interesting because really, really the, the effect, the, the relationship between the stratosphere and sort of subseasonal predictability, subseasonal regimes is definitely largest over the North Atlantic, but I think it's interesting that it perhaps offers something similar over North America. And we have this similar of like a weak, favored weak regime, two for the strong, one invariant, similar to the North Atlantic, which we think about a bit later, a bit further. Um, and I think this is a useful way of thinking about why the, the, the troposphere responds so differently following, say, a major sudden warming, because we have these, this spectrum of possible regime states. But I also think what, what I do want to highlight is that the, the leading mode of, of stratospheric variability, as U100, doesn't seem to change the likelihood of Alaskan ridging. And now we know that Alaskan ridging is the regime that's most associated with severe cold over North America. So I think the key takeaway from that is that it doesn't seem like looking for a weak stratospheric vortex is particularly useful for looking for extreme cold over North America like it is for Northwest Europe. Um, and we have some ongoing work to, to try and understand this a bit more. Um, I'm just going to move past that, actually, and think about this. So I, I, I've talked about why regimes are, are an easier thing to deal with than um, EOFs, but it doesn't mean that we can't think of the two together. And so we're performing this clustering in EOF space, so it's worth looking at where the regimes actually fall in the EOFs that we're clustering in, or the PCs that we're clustering in. And so this figure here shows the coordinates for the 12 PCs of the, of the four regimes. And I think the first thing that you can see is that everything beyond the third EOF, these distances are minimal. And because we're trying to minimize the distance when we assign the regimes, it effectively means that everything from EOF four onwards doesn't actually really matter for the regime attribution, which is great because it means we can just think about these leading three EOFs where we have these large distances. 
And now those leading three EOFs are these. Um, they're not necessarily canonical EOFs. It's a, it's a reduced domain, they're a C500. Uh, but can we use the two together to get a better understanding of what our regimes are doing, what our clusters are doing? And I think we can. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of going to rattle through a bit of this, but the, the, this is from a paper which is still under review at General of Climate, it's been there nearly a year now, um, where we do a regression between the, the principal component time series for those three PCs and U100. And what we find are significant relationships that effectively explain almost all of the Z500 linear response to U100. And so what we go with that is to say, well, if the, if the U100 is modulating the behavior of these EOFs, then it's also going to modulate the position in this PC space and, and modulate the regimes. And so from that, we can construct a vector, which is a three-dimensional vector in this space, uh, which we call the stratospheric perturbation vector, which describes that linear effect in principal component space of that stratospheric perturbation. So PC1, PC2, PC3 multiplied by a delta U100 is our beta. And then we can also think about the, the vector that describes the transitions in this space and then ask, are they pointing in a similar direction to ascertain whether that linear response of the stratosphere would push you in the direction that you need to go to complete a transition vector. And if you look at that in a 3D figure, uh, what's shown here is the, the centroids of each of the regimes in the colored squares, the transition vectors between the regimes in the, in the colored arrows, and this stratospheric perturbation vector for positive and negative dashed for each of the four regimes. And hopefully what you can see is that some of these vectors are close, like some of these transition vectors lie closer to the stratospheric perturbation vector than others. So for example, these two, I know it could be a trick of the eye, but we'll get to that, appear to be pointing in a very similar direction, whereas these are almost pointing orthogonally. And so that suggests that we can perhaps use this to understand to a first order approximation this kind of linear behavior in this regime space. And we can quantify that by considering the angle between the two vectors uh, to assess whether or not they're, they're pointing in a similar direction, whether there's a positive contribution, uh, positive projection in that direction. And then say that a smaller angle means that it's the, the effect of that stratospheric perturbation vector is more likely to lead to a regime transition because there's more of a projection in that direction. And then we can uh, make what almost look like protractors to quantify the, these angles. And I'm not going to spend the time and go into the, the nitty gritty of this, but the, the key takeaway is that these, this angle-based approach using this um, linear response vector is entirely consistent with what we saw with those differences in the regime frequency. So we saw that the Arctic high was much more likely when the vortex was weak, and this is consistent with, with uh, what we find from the angles, because for a negative beta, that weakening vector, it's very close to pointing directly from all other regimes toward the Arctic high regime. And we found that Alaskan Ridge general insensitivity to, to U100, and, and as kind of illustrated with that 3D plot, the vectors are almost, they're, they're, they're all very close um, to, to 90 degrees. So you, you're very unlikely to end up in or transition from the Alaskan Ridge regime, given this linear framework. And then for the other two, it, it's kind of opposite to Arctic high. So I think this does offer a, a way of interpreting how your regime clustering and your EOFs are behaving together. And, and we go into this in a lot more detail in the paper. So hopefully that does come out soon and, and you, can, you can find out more. So uh, moving on, we can then think about this Texas cold wave. So uh, I probably don't need to explain the Texas cold wave to anyone, um, but it, it was preceded by a major sudden stratospheric warming on the 5th of January. Uh, and we can see that in this polar cap geopotential height anomalies, which were, were raised in a negative NAM for the next six weeks. And the, the Texas cold wave peak is here, right at the end, actually, of this period of, of negative Northern annular mode through through the depth of the, the troposphere and lower stratosphere. So let's think about these regimes and what we know uh, and what, what I've gone through and say, well, we know that following an SSW when the vortex is weak, that the Arctic high is much more likely. But we know that that's not the main cause or the or the, the this main cause of US cold waves, that the, the probability of a cold wave given the given the Arctic high is, is not the maximum. So perhaps we wouldn't be thinking about it being the Arctic high. 
So we know that the Alaskan Ridge regime is much more likely to be associated with cold waves, but we know that that doesn't seem to care about whether or not the vortex is weak. So if it was that, that then suggests that maybe this SSW, this vortex weakening event, wasn't actually important for the Texas cold wave, which I think is, 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 a, is a curious idea. So I actually had to dig around and found that in late January, I had tweeted a forecast of the regime saying that the, 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 North, the, the, the GEFs was predicting a transition to Alaskan ridging uh, re regime during February, that that was associated with severe cold and that we should watch out for severe cold, which I didn't realize I'd actually said at the time. And the, the forecast here does indeed show quite a large likelihood. Uh, so this is for the, the new subseasonal GEFs V12. Um, it shows a quite a high likelihood of, of Alaskan ridging. So it seemed like a subseasonal precursor that was predictable. But is that actually what happened? So th this is a, 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 one way of doing it. So we can see the, at the top here, so this is for era five for that winter. This is the attributed regime by its minimum Euclidean distance. Um, so th th this is true for every day. And then in this, uh, in the, in this time series, this is the, the regime amplitude. And I've, I've grayed out between plus and minus one sigma, uh, and then put markers for when it's greater than one sigma to indicate it's sort of a, an active regime in a sense. And, and what you can see from that is that whilst every day is assigned to a regime, there are only some periods when you actually have a, an amplified, maybe true regime in amongst that. And so the Texas cold wave period to 14th to the 17th of February is shown in this rectangle. Now, what's immediately very interesting is that there is no there, there is no active regime really during that time. The Texas cold wave did not project strongly onto any of the four regimes. It didn't even anti-project onto a regime. And that was because it, it occurred during a transition event. I've alluded to this idea that it occurred right at the end of the weak vortex event. Well, actually, we'd had kind of a persistent Arctic high regime through January, early February, which then began to dissipate as that weak vortex dissipated. And it transitioned into Arctic low as the stronger vortex ensued afterward. And the Texas cold wave occurred right as that transition occurred. It was a transitory event in a sense, as the regime dissipated and the pattern shifted, a load of cold air fell out of the Arctic, for want of better words, and led to an extreme weather event. That has several consequences for the potential predictability problem, because if you're looking at regimes for predicting extremes, actually, this suggested absolutely nothing from, from a regime standpoint, although it was interesting that apparently we got the, the right answer for the wrong reasons from some of the regime forecasts. And so that does to me suggest that it wasn't necessarily the stratospheric warming that was important for this cold wave. Perhaps it couldn't have happened had this Arctic high regime happened beforehand, but it's certainly not one-to-one -one for what happened back on the 5th, 5th of January and the cold wave in mid-February. Right, so moving towards uh, wrapping up so that um, people can um, finish eating their lunch. Let's have a look at this winter. So uh, this winter has also been quite interesting from a regime standpoint, um, and, and we can see that in this time series here. Um, so through December and into early January, we had an exceptionally amplified and persistent Arctic low regime. And you can see that here reaching nearly three sigma in late December and, and setting a record actually for the number of December days that were assigned to this regime. Perhaps a curi curious feature was that actually in, in late December, you actually had almost two regimes simultaneously active as we had some Greenland blocking develop, but the pattern generally across North America remained dominated by this Arctic low feature. Again, I think that's a useful place for where a regime based approach is, is perhaps more helpful. And then that decayed as we went into the new year, uh, and we sort of gradually moved towards being in, in Alaskan ridging, which is associated with that transition from the exceptionally mild December that, that the US experienced into the much colder um, 2022 so far. What I also think is interesting in this from, from perhaps a predictability standpoint, and, and perhaps we need to think of a way of doing this, is to understand this idea that really the variability this winter has been only in two of the four regimes I mentioned. We've been generally constrained to be Alaskan Ridge or Arctic low and Pacific trough and Arctic high mostly absent. And I think that perhaps hints that there was a window of opportunity here. We've had a very strong stratospheric vortex, which we know leads to things like the Arctic low being much more likely and suppresses 
the likelihood of, of Arctic high. But it's just interesting that our variability has only really been in two of the four dimensions in, in regime space. And then um, I think this is a final slide to, to think about that this is actually useful from a public communications perspective. So I make these forecasts daily um, using the, the guest V12 subseasonal run and tweet them out. And actually public meteorologists like, like Eric Fisher and Scott Sable here, who are not tweeting technical information a lot of the time to their followers, picked up on these and found them really useful ways of talking about the extended range forecast and talking directly to the public. And people were getting this idea that like, like this idea to see the transition from the big Alaskan ridge bringing us cold now, that people were getting that idea of an object, that, that a recurrent object that they can think about. They can just think Alaskan ridge. They don't have to think about the NAO and the PNA and try and work that out, which obviously wouldn't work beyond the real uh, meteorologist sector. And I think in a sense, this has a parallel with atmospheric rivers. So there's a quote from Dwayne Walliser in, um, in a recent book that, that points out that Atmospheric rivers have helped in the dialogue with the general public and media, allowing for a readier understanding of the phenomena than what might otherwise be the case with a more cryptic scientific terminology. And actually, I think regimes do the same. I think they are these, these objects that, that you can just very easily talk about and that simplify the extended range. To have people talking about subseasonal forecasts in such a public front with so, such easy one-to-one -one kind of Alaskan ridge cold, Arctic low warmer, ideas is is amazing and and so i'm really amazed that this that this has worked in a public communication standpoint and i'm keen to see where it can go so in summary um regimes or maybe their weather types maybe they're just clusters but they do offer a condensed method to view the large-scale patterns uh, the method's particularly useful when there's large spread in different diagnostics simultaneously and that goes from sub-seasonal to seasonal to seasonal to decadal scales Largely, your uncertainty comes from the domain that you're computing your regimes over. But I think everybody's kind of the literature is is condensing on um, or converging on this idea of four similar North American wintertime regimes. Um, and they have now been used in the context of understanding climate change and differences in the response there. Regimes can help us understand better stratosphere troposphere coupling and weather extremes, although perhaps not in the case of the, the Texas cold wave. And then I, I know I kind of rattled through it, but this, this linear model or linear theory of, of the, the EOF response and the regime response is consistent with the regime behavior. Uh, the February 2021 cold wave didn't project strongly onto any of the regimes, which is uh, a really interesting result, I think. Um, and then this winter has also been dominated by persistent regimes, which translate naturally to, to extremes that we've seen uh, from a uh, weather perspective. I think the regime viewpoint has proved anecdotally popular on social media for communicating extended range forecasts. Uh, and I'm interested to see where that goes. And then in terms of where next, I think we need a better understanding of the role of stratospheric wave reflection in driving the Alaskan Ridge regime. Um, so this is a paper which is being led by Gabrielle Missouri uh, and a few, few of us from, from Europe that where well, we, we quantify this, this link and we actually do find a link between localized stratospheric wave reflection um, and the Alaskan Ridge, which kind of hints toward more higher order stratospheric variability as being important for, for North American cold. Um, and then I think we just need to think about how we exploit what we know. All these things that I've discussed here, the, the new work that's being done about wave reflection and all that to actually make useful longer term predictions, how we can work out what a magnitude of regime signal is useful, how much ensemble um, confidence do we expect to see on these scales? And, and think perhaps in a, in a, in a process-based storyline-like approach where we think about things like the stratospheric vortex, the MJO, wave reflection, base states like ENSO, and think about that in terms of how these may modulate our long lead time forecast of regimes to understand what might occur and to give useful information. And then I, I've not written it here, but I actually think there's a, there's a possibility of looking at this more in the, in the summer perspective. I'm not particularly aware of, of an equivalent amount of work going into North American summertime regimes. This occurred to me during the extreme Pacific Northwest heat wave, but that might be also an interesting thing um, to look at. But as someone who concerns himself mainly with wintertime variability, it doesn't often occur to me to think about the summer season, uh, but that's also something which might be worth considering. So I, I think I'll leave uh, the main 
main discussion there and I'm honestly happy to uh, to discuss now or, or um, any time later. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Simon, for that wonderful talk. Um, I can't see any questions right now in the chat, but um, if somebody has a question, um, please know that we have the chat um, or you could just speak up. Questions or comments? Uh, that was really nice talk. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just jumped in. Um, so thinking more about you know the, the the cold weather snap in Texas, that prolonged heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, uh, events like Hurricane Harvey. Not just that the fact it was a hurricane; it was the fact that it kind of got there and stalled out. So thinking about how systems stall out. I mean, I guess regimes is one way that you see it portrayed in popular media, but since you brought up rivers, that's um, maybe the other way that people think about these things is, you know, like polar vortex, it's like a wavy river when you have a decreased um, meridional gradients and it, things can kind of snake around and stall out. I don't know what the best way to communicate that is, but I, I think it's definitely interesting to think about reasons that systems, whether they're heat waves or extreme rain events or whatever, stall out. So if there's um, yeah, other way, ways to, to, is it, is the regime, since you didn't tag the cold snap on, on necessarily one of the regimes, like, is it something else going on there that causes things to just stall out? I, I think that's a really interesting um, idea because naturally, obviously from regimes, there is this idea of stationarity. Um, and that's perhaps one of the things that you really look for from a regime and that naturally relates to, to things stalling out. And I think Jennifer Francis was involved in or, or led a study which suggested that regime duration had, or regime persistence had increased in the observed era in the observed era. But I don't think the regime was necessarily linked that well with with the regimes that I was speaking about here. And um, so perhaps perhaps that's something interesting to look at is the persistence time, the residence time of these regimes. Um, and then I, I guess something which is worth looking at as well relating to Texas is whether or not transition events are also associated with extremes. But the problem is it's it, the reanalysis area, at least, is a very small sample of transitions. Once you go from four regimes to four, three others for each one, you have a very low sample. So there's perhaps something to do in a large ensemble model framework, but it, it, that's also a possibility, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Allegra. Um, so I can see that Ron Miller uh, has a question. Uh, Ron, would you like to ask that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this is really interesting work. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, when, when people think about the, the annular modes, um, you know, one of the things that's very characteristic is there's this strong vertical coupling. Um, and in fact, the projection of the annular modes, you know, onto the flow is actually kind of a minimum around 500 millibars of higher hectopascal, if I remember correctly. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, how robust do you think these these uh, regimes are if you start including other levels and do you think you would get additional predictability for example i think it's, it's interesting because it, that's another common question um given that annular mode issue at at, uh, at 500 i think some so, so a component of that comes from the idea that the the sort of leading eof that you get at 500 is not really the characteristic nam pattern which is somewhat solved in a regimes framework because you're not just isolating one EOF by taking all three, you get most of that signal some some way or another. Um, as for the as for the actual choice of level, I think if you go lower, the concern over North America was the mountain west. Um, so I think that 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 definitely probably would impact things. Um, and then it would turn different once you start getting things like MSLP. The problem with MSLP is it translates very badly into models, um, which is which is a, which is always a challenge with that variable. And um, I, I I I don't know honestly. I haven't thought about it too much. Um, but it is generally quite standard to be talking about 500 in terms of geopotential height regimes. In terms of jet regimes, it's quite common to use something like U850 to like Tim Wallings' North Atlantic jet regimes. Um, yeah, that, that's something I need to think about a bit more. Good question. Thanks. Any more uh, questions? 
Could I ask one more? Oh, yeah, sure. And I can see then that uh, David has a question after. Well, why don't you let, why don't you let David go first? Uh, I'll, I'll come in after. Oh, okay. Uh, David, would you like to ask that or I, I can also read it? Uh, you can read it, Clara. Okay. Um, yeah, so David asks, um, so are there Southern Hemisphere winter regimes despite the reduced topography? And if so, has anyone looked at whether they will change with climate in a way that may influence high latitudes? I think that's the idea. I, I think there will, there will definitely, you will definitely be able to produce some kind of a regime for whatever domain you're considering, because the, me the mechanics of it will always, you'll produce a cluster, whether or not it's a true regime, I suppose, is, is the other matter. Um, as, as far as I'm aware, not, not, not extensively looked at, um, I think, and I think largely because it doesn't get the same, it doesn't trigger the same desire to look for it because you go, well, there's fewer stationary waves, so fewer regimes. Uh, it could be interesting to investigate, yeah. Okay, thanks, it's also, sorry, it's also hard to choose a domain in the Southern Hemisphere because it's circular. So if you look for the hemispheric wide ones, it could be interesting. Great, thanks, David. Uh, so Ron, would you like to ask your second question? Yeah, so um, so I think one of the interesting things you showed was that during the, the Texas cold wave, the cold snap, um, was that you didn't really have a dominant mode at all. And I'm, and I'm wondering if that's because that was key to the dynamics that you had a transition, or is it possible that maybe, you know, by by picking four regimes, you kind of filter to the point where where you lost you, you lost the ability to, to represent the physics of, the, of this event. I mean, it could be the Texas cold wave was actually something that's dynamically doesn't happen very often, and so therefore, you know, you 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 may it may show up as noise, you know, when when you start trying to, to calculate regimes. I just was wondering if that, you know, is something you looked at at all. If like maybe there was something really exceptional about the Texas cold snap um, that you know made it rare, um, and therefore something that you you know possibly didn't show up when you when you just went to four regimes. So it's, a, it's a great question. So to, to my mind, it does ex it's consistent with it being an exceptional event because it doesn't show up in the regimes. Um, and I think that those two go together quite well. It's, it's potentially worth seeing what happens if you do increase, if you do run this again, but you increase K and you see if, if a higher order K captures something that's also worth doing. Um, but I think really when you look at the evolution of it in space, it, it is, you had a, 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 a ridge over Greenland, which just began to dissipate and it was, it was the sort of motion of that and it was, it was a fluid event. It was, this, it was, you know, only a few days. So it's, it's not naturally going to come out in this sort of regime approach, which is looking on those longer time scales. Um, but they could also relate to the level. I think if you maybe went lower down in, into the troposphere, you would, you would maybe see something else with that shallow, uh, cold uh, behavior. But yeah, it, really interesting. It's it's something I'll um, have to think about a bit more. It would be interesting, for example, to get that 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 uh, the three D space and plot the trajectory um, in those leading three EOFs of that that period of time, that fourteenth to the seventeenth, and actually see where it went. I think it could be a, an interesting thing to do. I mean, are are you pretty confident that this this you know this this regional signature in, in 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 Texas in the Midwest was was captured by by the the leading three EOFs or I guess maybe that's kind of the heart of my question is if you maybe just had this unusual you know black swan event that you know ends up showing up out at like EOF number you know seven or something like that. I, I, so I think that's when it becomes that that's when you start thinking about well how much you're trying to capture if you're trying to use this framework for these. For these things at long lead times, if you start including that sort of thing, you'll never get anything useful because you'd have too much higher order variability. Sure. And that's perhaps why this is difficult because you want to capture these events as well, but they don't show up. So maybe it is a bit of a quandary in that regard. You could look at that, for example, like in these long pre-industrial control runs, you know, that are available, um, you know, in the, uh, in the in the archive, in the CMIP archive. Um, you, know, you could just you know basically see how long um, I mean the you know ERA five starts in 1979 but but uh, um, and that's a constraint that you have but you know there are longer time series that are available in the archives and you know there's always the question like do you believe the models but maybe you could at least look at the question of how robust you know these patterns are um, you know as, as as your training or sorry as your statistics you know as as, as your your analysis period lengthens. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, that, and you can also do it in a in a in a bottom up way, in that you look for the the idea of looking for the impacts. This has been done in relation to linking regimes with um, renewable energy predictability, is to to actually start from your impact variable and kind of target it in a backward sense. And so perhaps you could also do that for for this sort of event. Yeah, no, it, it, it does sound like a, a a good avenue to explore. That's a good point about impacts. Great, thanks, Ron. Um, so I think David has another question. David? Uh, well, actually, it was a, sort of a follow-up to the previous one. Uh, one of the reasons for asking is you may know that there's been a strong sort of by dichotomy, actually, in what happens to sea ice in the wet LC and the Ross Sea. And so in one, one area, sea ice had been increasing, the other area, sea ice decreasing as time has gone on. And people have related that to persistent circulation modes in which where the sea ice has been increasing, you're getting cold air coming off Antarctica, and where it's decreasing, you're getting air from the north in that region. But more recently, sea ice has now changed, and now sea ice is decreasing everywhere. And the question is, is there some sort of regime mode that has picked in in the Southern Hemisphere? Or was there some that was acting, that were acting at the high latitudes to begin with that gave us this sort of sea ice change? And, and of course, that then affects sort of predictions for Antarctic ice sheets and things of that nature. I, I, I absolutely think that that's the sort of question that re the regime framework can help can help answer, yeah. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, my apologies, but I do want to actually ask one question myself. Um, Simon, it's a, uh, on the last slide, um, I think you had um, stated that they help us, these kinds of regime frameworks help us understand maybe a bit mechanistically um, what's uh, just the stratosphere troposphere coupling. Um, and then I, you did have kind of a second point from the bottom um, which seems to suggest that perhaps that's through kind of a better understanding or relation of wave reflection and these regimes. I, I was wondering if you could just make a comment on that more. Um, are you saying that maybe because of the kind of more spatial um, physical nature of these things, you, you can better link kind of how the waves are actually propagating and, and then potentially why or why not maybe kind of certain events may couple down to them? Um, is, is, that, is that kind of what you're going for when you when you talk about the, the better understanding of the stratosphere troposphere coupling, I think it was it was sort of two twofold. So I think the first thing is that you uh, maybe I should go to the slide for it. Um, if you take you take the North Atlantic regimes, if you look at the regimes that are probably the probability of regimes in a weak state, you can actually see that it's not the case that that. So this is looking at all the red bars in isolation. It's not the case that one of them is hugely greater than the others. And in fact, actually, it's the difference in magnitude of like NaO minus is way greater than the difference in magnitude between the regimes in the same vortex state. And that's largely also true for, for the strong, although NaO minus kind of goes off on its own. And so I think that was just trying to say this idea that it suggests that the, the, you're not getting the, in a real world sense, you, you, you're not getting the full answer just from that stratospheric change. You can see this sort of idea of the troposphere Having a, a, a large um, a large uh, role to play in what state you're ending up in, and then I think in terms of the wave reflection, it, it's less so about the sort of mechanics of that of that reflection, but in terms of almost thinking of that 3D space and and kind of where you are within that space and the effect that that reflection is having and where it's moving you towards. And you can kind of classify that. We, I guess the, the idea that we've got coming from this paper that um, hopefully we're going to wrap up and submit soon is that it, it, in, in the same way that, like for example, weakening the stratospheric vortex moves you toward Arctic high, the occurrence of a stratospheric wave reflection event moves you toward Alaskan ridging. And, and really that's very similar to like the, the Cadera papers from, from like 2016 that, that have this more descriptive sense of there's a, a ridge in Alaska and downstream um, zonality over the Atlantic, but it's kind of quantifying it within this within this framework. Hopefully, that in some way answers the questions. 
Great. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think at this point, uh, we're about 10 minutes um, after two. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today. And I want to thank you, Simon, for giving a really nice talk. Um, thank you. I hope that uh, we are all able to see each other in person quite soon. Uh, we run dynamics meetings at GIS, so um, it will be great to, to, to see you in person and to hear more about your work. Um, so with that, I'm going to end this. And, and if anyone wants to, to access the recording, just let me know, which, but it should be up within about two weeks. Um, so uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to close and, and thank you again. Thanks, Thanks Simon. That was really nice. Thank you.